All right, team. Hi, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. So this webcast is part of the ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. Um, I'm your moderator for today. My name is Sophie Watson, and I work as a data scientist at NVIDIA. Um, focusing on tools and techniques for accelerating data science and machine learning workflows and workloads. I'm also a member of the ACM Practitioner Board and the Professional Development Committee here at the ACM. Um, so for those of you who may be unfamiliar with the ACM or what it has to offer, um, I hope that you can see some more information on the screen right now that Jan is sharing for us. But let me tell you a little bit more about that. So the ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. And you can see some of the highlights on your screen. These include things like access to the ACM Digital Library, which is the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature. Um, we also have access to and provide a range of leading publications and global conferences from the ACM. So these um, Thanks for sharing screen, Jan. Um, these uh, draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics. Um, furthermore, the ACM provides support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. And finally, um, Last but not least, the ACM provides the ACM Code of Ethics, which is a collection of principles and guidelines which are handcrafted and designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in a professional practice. Now, before we get started today, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping items. Um, you can see these on the slide shown to you. If you have questions at any time, please use Zoom's Q&A. Um, feature so that we can definitely find them in amongst the chat. So go to that Q&A rather than the chat. We'll organize the questions as Jamark is speaking today and we'll try to get to as many as possible. This session is being recorded and it will be archived. You'll receive an email notification when that becomes available. And as always, you can check on learning.acm.org for updates on this and our up and coming other webcasts. Finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please do take a minute to fill it out. It helps us to understand what you want to see from Tech Talks and how we can improve our Tech Talks series going forward. So with that, um, I'm going to introduce today's speaker. So we are extremely excited um, today to be here to hear this presentation on the state of data mesh by Jamak Dagani. Jamar works as the founder and CEO of Next Data, a tech startup with a mission to change the experience of creating, sharing, discovering, and using data forever to be connected fast and fair on data mesh principles. Jamar founded the concept of data mesh in 2018, and since then has been uh, implementing and evangelizing that concept within the wider industry. And she's the author of two fantastic books. Um, the first is Software Architecture, The Hard Parts. And the second, most relevant to our talk today, is Data Mesh from O'Reilly Media. Jamak serves on multiple tech advisory boards and has worked as a technologist for more than 24 years, contributing to multiple patents in the distributed computing communications. She's also an advocate for decentralization of all things, including architecture, data and power. So Jamak, without further ado, let me hand over to you to take it away. Sophie, thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. I will share my screen and we get right into it. State of Data Mesh. Um, as Sophie mentioned, I think the introduction's there. I put two links down in the bottom of the screen for you to get free access to these books on O'Reilly platform for a limited time um, uh, that, uh, that they allow. Okay, why uh, do we need yet another 
um, approach to analytical data management, why we need a decentralized or a distributed approach. And the reason is that we are at an inflection point. The way we had imagined how data shall be managed and accessed for AI and ML and analytics really has reached its limits. What this diagram is trying to show, based on my personal observation and research in the industry, that as organizations grow in their complexity, as um, more business domains or domains or applications within the you know within organizations want to use AI and ML in every function of the business, the impact and their ability to do that kind of plateaus in terms of uh, time to innovate with data, in terms of how quickly they can respond to change and how resilient they can be uh, when they get to, you know, um, when change happens. So data mesh as an approach to managing essentially data for analytics and AI was based on the assumption that organizations are hairy, messy, and complex. And if that's the state of being, as that's the default state of being, how do we need to change our approach to get access to data? I put another um, a report here from New Vantage Partners, the um, result of um, kind of surveys that they do with Fortune 1000 companies every year, and they put these results out. And two numbers stood out to me. One was the amount of money that we are, you know, companies are spending for their data and AI solutions. Of course, the spending is ubiquitous, 99% of population that they surveyed. They had investment and more than half of them, 62% were investing more than $50 million, which is not a negligible amount. But on the other side, if you look at the impact of that investment, 24% of those companies are claiming to be data driven, competing using the data. And more, you know, just under half, um, um, half of those companies, nearly half, are ubiquitously applying data at scale in production, uh, widespread within the company. So there is a mismatch between our efforts and spending and the outcomes that are getting. And, you know, the, the skeptics in the room might say, well, we've been busy. We have been innovating and building data management solutions for decades now. And we have been addressing this problem of scale around volume of the data, right? With kind of Hadoop and parallel processing, uh, Hadoop and MapReduce, how do we process a large amount of data? We, we, we address the volume scale, we address a variety of scale with having different databases, object storage and time series, and now vector storage, like those diversity of ways in managing the types of data. And we are, we have invented technologies that take to care of the scale of speed and velocity of the data, like the you know, stream processing for both analytics and, and operational systems. But we have what we hadn't focused on so far is a technology or an approach to technology and organization that manages the scale of human system, the scale of organizational complexity. And that's where I think is the gap and the next frontier for innovation is, is to build something that scales as human system scales. So the, the under, underpinning, I guess, assumptions that data mesh challenges and tries to resolve to get this sort of fast moving data, you know, companies that are innovating using data is remove this centralized thinking we have assumed for a very long time, the data is like water, the data is like oil, you've got to extract it from different sources, and then because all these sources are siloed, and then put them in some under some sort of centralized control organizationally and technology wise, so that you can get value from it downstream so that you can do, you know, pattern matching and cross correlation across different dimensions. And the way we had imagined this process was, okay, you put data through pipelines, and there's like, you know, tons of technologies around pipelining, and then you put them in lake or lake house or some central storage, and then you layer it with access and governance. This process fundamentally, and I know I fundamentally has a bottleneck, right? I know I have comically drawn a big box to get a point across, but you can imagine that people that are stuck in the middle, they're getting data from folks that really have no understanding, 
nor incentive to providing data that is immediately valuable and usable in an analytical context. Um, people on the right are kind of frustrated because their time to get access to data is very long. And when they get, they can't really trust it because the actual source business has moved on. So we build, build a fraction, like functionally siloed, centralized way that it's why it's a wonderful way to get started in a less complex environment is a very difficult situation to scale as the number of sources on the left hand side and as the number of applications of data on the right hand side increases. And despite the fact that I draw these like pretty straight lines and you know kind of organized diagram in, in the previous um previous slide, there is the reality is that the lack of kind of these peer-to-peer standards for data sharing across technology boundaries has resulted in an architecture that reminds me of the story of Tower of Babel. Uh, I'm not sure how many how many folks know about this uh, story, but it, it goes as, you know, the, uh, the people have decided that they build the, the tallest city and this tower is that's going to reach the heavens but they didn't speak the same language so what they ended up building is beautifully depicted by this you know 1600 um uh flemish painting something that's barely hanging together and it's falling apart and probably a lot of point to point kind of sticking uh pieces that don't fit together um uh, you know in in this structure and that's the story of where we are i think with kind of analytical data um, thinking that because we didn't have incentives for opening the data up or sharing that for analytical and ML purposes, we don't have that level of standardization that we see with operational APIs. We do have some standardizations evolving, and that's great with file formats or database formats and so on. Um, but we're still stuck in a world of point to point building connectors from one system to another system so that we can share data um, to do you know, beyond one system kind of analytics. So uh, how does data mesh tries to unlock <laughs> this value that is there for us to tap into in, in this kind of messy and complex environment? Um, if I want to depict a picture, again, a comically drawn, um, colorful picture of what how we can imagine data mesh was in, in implemented is really um, the distribution of responsibility for analytical and ML data sharing uh, across organization in a way that that responsibility is pushed to people that are best positioned to serve that data. And who are those people? Those people are the ones closest to the data, either the origin or the, the, the source or application of that data. Um, where do people sit? Well, they sit in business domains, right? They sit in closest to the business. And I th don't think this is you know, a novel approach. If you think about back in the early 2000s, when we started rapidly moving to digitization of our capabilities in companies, we you know, learned very quickly this monolithic kind of IT or functional IT to be the servant to the business just did not scale, right? So we started creating this domain-oriented teams to pitch the teams, giving autonomy, working, aligning tech and business and ops really together. This is just a continuation of that. We're at that intersection again. Our approach to data is not organizational scaling. So we're, we're kind of continuing that trend or data mission is continuing that trend with pushing kind of data and analytics that's closer, closer to the business and closer to these cross-functional technology teams. What are these folks are working on? What are they building? What are they sharing? So data mesh introduces this concept of a data product. It's actually a computational concept. It's not just a data or a passive concept. It's an aggregation of all of the structural components that need to come together around a particular domain, whether it's customer information or order information, particular domain to share analytical, temporal kind of aggregated view of the data for that domain across time and different dimensions with the rest of the organization. But the moment you think about data as a product, it's not just, oh, there's the data and come and find it. I know there was a question around kind of catalog there. They actually share with, through APIs, 
discoverability information, metadata information, usability information, everything that's needed in a timely fashion so that a data user can be delighted finding it, can easily find it, can easily understand it, can easily get a sample and start using it. And finally, that emphasis on cross boundary, cross boundary, boundary being technology, organization and trust, data sharing is really, really key here and creating these APIs that allows that cross boundary data sharing. Again, it doesn't mean that necessarily you have to you know, push a ton of data through a thin pipe, but it means that you have standardized way of getting access to the data wherever it is. So this is kind of my, um, you know, my cartoonish picture of data mesh in action, as you can see how it tries to address those concepts. But when I first in introduced data mesh back in, um, I think it was like 2018 internally, and in 2019, I wrote my first blog, I was very um, cognizant of the fact that I didn't want to like kind of put out an architecture diagram or, um, you know, a particular solution or technology. I was hoping to start from first principles and really invite the community and the industry to kind of come up with the next next solutions much smarter than what I could have come up with um, and, and practices so these were the four principles underpinning data mesh thinking around data mesh I think they still apply and I would like to just walk you through for the rest of this um, for uh, in quickly through what these pillars are the very first pillar I think is the foundation really of data mesh is about decentralization of responsibility so that we can scale out not scale up scale out um, kind of application of data and usage of data and to give to put that in uh, um, I guess in context uh, uh, I want to use a fictional con uh, context as Carl Sagan says imagination often carries us to places we've never been, but without imagination, we go nowhere. So let me just like pick your imagination a little bit and talk about this fictional company called Daft Inc. That's what I called it in uh, in my book. And actually, maybe I just ask you a little question. If you can, uh, if you know what the name stands for, maybe we can have a little competition here. Um, yeah, so that thing they are, a, you know, they are a, um, oh, I just realized I changed my example. Um, this is an e-commerce company um, and they, like any e-commerce company, you know, you have chat, you have teams that are, sorry, they are a commerce company. There's a retail company and like any retail company, they have an e-commerce team, right? What is the business outcome of that domain is growth through digital channels, right? So they have probably a bunch of applications, microservices, um, user facing applications that runs the e-commerce business. And what data mesh suggests is that these cross-functional team and now has people that are working closely with the app dev teams and building these data products around any data that honestly can both help the e-commerce team and the rest of the organizations to achieve the, the business outcome they're looking for. Here might be, you know, Amazon sales information, sales that are happening on different channels or Amazon Walmart, sorry, Walmart sales or whatever uh, the commerce team is, um, uh, is interacting with digitally. Uh, there might be a retail shop domains, right? These are the folks that are working with uh, the point of sales applications and logistics and things that are in inventory of the shops so that they can sell through retail channels. And there could be a, a many different data products, again, for app available for analytical use cases across, you know, sales, inventory, uh, retail customers, and so on. And if you want to get, you know, products effectively, you have shipping domain. And all of these domains are exchanging data, exchanging analytical APIs, ex, you know, ex putting ML into actions. For example, their um, self is a lot more expert than I am, than I'm pretending even to be. But you know, you can perhaps change the imagine changing the shipping and logistics and routing uh, problem from solving that problem from probably some sort of a rule-based engines to um, you know, data science optimization kind of um, application. So, but to do that, you need to have access to data products from the, the inventory, like how, which shops are running out of inventory where as one of the inputs parameters. So that's kind of in a nutshell what domain-oriented ownership is. Data as a product, uh, is the second pillar, and it was really put in place to counterbalance the challenges that can arise from this domain-oriented 
you know, ownership of the data. And that's often is a problem that we had before, which is siloing of the data, right? What, 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 what incentive do I have as commerce team to share Amazon sales data with the rest of the organization? I'm using it myself and I'm improving, I don't know, our contracts or our relationship with Amazon or how our products is showing up. Uh, but really, I don't have much incentive. And that's data products tries to change that, tries to change a relationship with data from data being an asset to data being a product. I don't have much incentive to share my assets. I don't know about you guys, but as a product, it's a different story. As a product, um, we want to delight and enable and empower the users of the product. So what I could think of, which is really a build up on top of what we had in the past as far is this um, eight, I guess, characteristics that in my mind are the absolute minimum to consider data as a product. And maybe you can be, um, you know, shortened as that acronym up there at DAP units. Uh, so what are these characteristics? If you put yourself in the shoes of a data user, what is their journey uh, that they go through to use data that feels like using a product, right? First is that I have a hypothesis out question. I wonder where can I find the data that can possibly answer this question, can possibly be explored to, to, to find some patterns, right? I have to discover the data. So every data product, not centrally, every single data product itself has a mechanism for it to be discovered. Well, okay, as a data user, I discovered it. I need to understand the data. What mechanisms every data product individually, again, not something else outside in the universe, but the data product itself provides for it to be understandable. So this could be anything ranging from just a basic schema to computational notebooks to sample data, anything that helps with understanding. It needs to be, okay, I understand it. I need to trust it. How the data can be trustworthy. Again, trust is closing the gap between what we know and what we don't know. So what, what, what gap remains to be closed? And that's the SLOs, the metrics that really defines uh, how complete the data is, how timely it is, and what population includes, what our population doesn't include, anything that helps me again answer, is this the right data that I can responsibly sh sh use to create some insight? Um, every single data well shall be addressable. So I, I don't, don't go through all of this, but there's eight of this and in the book, I expand on what, what, what these things are. Um, but maybe one of the, the ones that are really important to me is this natively accessible. If you think about how we shard data today, how do we distribute where we put the data? One of those access we use is technology. Oh, do we want to use this data as some sort of a SQL endpoint with you know, data warehouse kind of um, uh, snowflake model, or do we want to use this as columnar features, or do we want to use it as a graph? So depending on this technical mode of access and topology of storage, we end up copying the same data all over the place. So if we change that and say the first class concern for encapsulating a con concern around data is the domain, then the second class concern becomes in what endpoints, in, in what modes and topologies and syntax I need to share this data. So then you have this concept of like outputs that provide that data in different modes of access, depending on whether it's an analyst running a SQL or whether it's a data scientist running a machine learning uh, training model. Um, inside of it, again, emphasizing data product is a computational and data unit. It's data transformation that creates the data and metadata and policies. Again, we try to go into the world that these data products autonomous, they can be autonomously owned and managed and we don't depend on, you know, this disparity units within the organization to, uh, to support. Of course, there is uh, infrastructure support and that takes us to the third pillar. Um, if you think about this, what we've heard so far, I think people that are thinking kind of critically, they go, so do you mean like every team needs to go build a full data stack so that they can manage their data products autonomously? And the answer is no, because that just economically doesn't scale. So we need to think about layers of the platform or capabilities of technology that empower these teams so that they can effectively build and share data products. Um, the definition of the platform that I really love the most and folks at Team Topologies have done a fantastic jo a job of describing in their book 
is abstraction of complexity, right? And this is common complexity, the complexity that every domain team will have if they want to create these data products, if we want to share them, if they want to uh, you know, put, put discoverability in place, um, storage, computation, cataloging, and so on, processing. These are common concerns that not every team needs to reinvent the wheel. So uh, the, the third pillar is really about abstracting these and providing these capabilities. Again, as APIs, I'm a really big fan of API-first approach. In, I, when we create isolation of technology and integrations, everything as a service almost, and these lollipops are kind of my notation, uh, and you probably know now how old I am from the, <laughs> taken from back in the day UML notation, um, to show that really creating a self-serve set of APIs for people to access um, the, the, the technology to create data products is, um, uh, is, is something that we need to think about. So the last piece, again, counterbalancing this uh, now, a uh, dilemma that we have, which is we said, okay, you know, you can go and have your cake and eat it too, which is like decentralized data, have autonomy, and you get empowered by, you know, the self serve data platform, but don't get fat. Uh, this is the don't get fat part, which is you can have decentralized data, but you can still have some level of trust and a harmony in terms of those cross-functional concerns, we often call them governance concerns, across these isolated, you know, kind of independent, not isolated, in connected, in fact, through data products, but nevertheless, autonomous teams that are all moving at different speeds. So how can we make sure that we have some level of standardization in place that you know, when you discover data products across a mesh, you can still have a consistent experience of what does security mean? How does security gets implemented? What does discoverability look like? So uh, there's a fourth pillar to answer that, and it's a federated computational governance. It's really a combination of uh, two things combined, and I won't go through both of them. One is the federated operating model in terms of who makes decisions and how we make decisions as what needs to be standardized and what doesn't need to be standardized, what can be diversified, what decisions are made globally, what decisions are made locally. Like, I mean, in any organization, whether it's data mesh or something else, we are, I, I, I am building a company right now, even I'm struggling, you know, with sort of this, how do we make decisions, right? To give autonomy, but yet have enough global visibility to make the right, the right decision locally. So that's, just, that's the operating model and it's in the book, you can kind of have a look at it. But the piece that I want to double click here is really the computational part, is that right now a lot of the prior art on governance is centered around people in a, being in a very difficult position way late after the data has been produced, gone through pipelines, put in place, try to get their arms around what data do we have? Is this a gold data or is this silver data? And do stamping and write policy documents to apply it. Yes, there are tools have been built to kind of support them and augment their process with some sort of a you know machine-aided process, but nevertheless, it's fairly late. It's done by people that are not in the best position to actually put implement those controls. So this is again taking lessons learned from microservices and cloud migrations that we had to go from parameter based and fairly manual perhaps um, uh, you know security and policy to a zero trust almost architecture uh, by by encapsulating and codifying policies in at every single touch point in the most granular level here being data products. So every data product in data mesh has an ability to encode and codify and capture policies that applies to it internally or globally push to it and then uh, execute it at every point of read or write or access to the data. So where we are, so that was hopefully is a quick uh, sum up of what data mesh is about. Um, this talk about is about, is about also states of the data mesh, where are we? It's been a few years. I think really data mesh has captured hearts and minds. I put a few logos. There, there are many, many, many companies that are implementing data mesh and on their journey. Uh, and there is no common, you know, um, kind of sector that I would say, oh, this is only startups and scale ups. In fact, these are often large organizations that are very complex and very hairy, and they are feeling the pain points that data mesh surfaces. They're across the industry. Um, the interest in data mesh is growing, as you can see, as a 
kind of an entertainment factor. I put a couple of Google Trends um, uh, diagrams here. Uh, there is a large community that has grown and shout out to Scott Herleman for starting the community. And uh, it's actually now, um, uh, you know, getting uh, more support. Uh, and has grown very, very quickly. I, I remember when Scott and I talked about starting the community, he, he said, we put this quickly together, you know, Slack group together. And in 14 days, we had 1,000 people. And now we have more than, you know, 7,000. Every time I show this slide, I have to go and update it. So, um, and the podcast and so on. So there's a big community around. And then, of course, vendors had to respond almost overnight to their customers asking, where is my data mesh? And um, what we see is a lot of kind of quick features and building, layering kind of what we have with a single pane of view or um, using federated, repurposing kind of federated kind of um, glues that we had like federated query as being data mesh. Uh, but we're still um, not seeing a big pivot. Hopefully that would be the next generation technology providers that really reshape the behavior of developers from the point of generating data all the way through you know creating aggregates all the way to applying ml it's just that peer-to-peer -peer, uh decentralized ownership that is that is work still to be done we're not done here um so are we there yet i don't think so i think if i go back to uh, the definition of data measures you know um two things are really hard the hardest thing in technology is naming things so that was the first one and the second one is defining it. It was this was my attempt at defining this concept was as a decentralized socio-technical again, it's a technical and organization, not either, just one of those, both together, in a to manage and access data for analytics at scale within our cross organizations, uh, with a decentralized uh, in a decentralized distributed way. Um, and and we have been now that we've been kind of trying this with the tools that we had at hand. We've 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 seen some anti patterns that um, I, I can share with you. Is that the you know we have had created some functional silos like we had you know dev silos for a while, we had ops silos for a while. We converged to those two with DevOps movement. Now we had data silo, and, and these are natural, right? When a new um, methodology, a new paradigm, a new set of technologies get created, those information, the understanding of those technologies are not evenly distributed until the next generation come and learn them, right? So when that happens, we, we to optimize and get still be effectively applying those paradigms to technologies, we centralize people. And that's a very effective way to get started. So we have centralized data people under CDO and so, okay, you are responsible for function of data, regardless of the domain, regardless of the business unit, regardless of the business outcome, you're responsible for that. Um, and that has been the source of now challenge as we become more ambitious around our data innovation. So what the anti-pattern that our organization I often see is that data mesh is still confined within the walls of data team. And often while it can be helpful in creating some sort of a distribution of responsibility within the data team, the big bad kind of monolith is still sits in the middle. Like we're still not engaging with people in the operational domains. We're still not engaging people where they're applying the data. So uh, the, the, often these strategies end up being led by uh, CDOs, which is a very fantastic and welcoming move, but they're, they get limited, they get stuck. So what they need to do is really partner with the rest of the technology organization partner with the business units that are technically more savvy or data savvy and they want to move forward. I think the most perhaps successful implementations are where these partnerships form uh, very early on. Um, so how we, instead of just complaining, maybe I can also uh, share some, you know, kind of small steps that you can take toward this realignment of organization around domains and bringing data into the conversation. Um, and we can start with some incentives, right? Incentives are rewarding around data and product thinking of data. So instead of, for example, rewarding, often what we've done in the past, we've celebrated and rewarded how much data we have, right? Like we've got thousands of golden tables, right? Uh, um, golden stamped, high quality tables of data. That is not an indication of value. So maybe the 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 the, the, the metric to reward to change and slightly reshift re purpose and intention is to how well is data is data is working for you? How much usage are you getting? And how are those 
use cases are enabled? What's the net promoter score in terms of happiness of people using the data? So that's kind of, we can start there. In terms of organizational structure, um, uh, uh, I guess using my uh, former colleagues, thought on this inverse uh, Conway's maneuver by really reshaping the architecture intentionally so that the organization can shift with it, right? So starting this autonomous kind of data products, moving away from thinking about modern data stack as a, oh, I've got a pipeline and then, you know, I've got a few connectors and I wrote a SQL script and here we go. I dumped the data somewhere in the table. Like changing that mind share, mind share and creating um, you know, encapsulation of data products as described before, and then kind of getting people to uh, to organize around that. But never, no matter how many like carrots and sticks we use, the most effective way of creating change is to aligning internal human incentives and motivations with what we do. And that's to me is having empathy having the need for data in the domain so that they can also have empathy for their fellow, you know, um, domain teams uh, to share to share their data with the same level of care and uh, quality that expect they can expect from their the people. So that that mean to me means the last step, which is actually embedding data science and analytics into the domain and getting people closer and closer to live and breathe kind of the function of the domain, the business um, while working in the on the kind of more advanced um, application of the data within the domains uh, themselves. Um, let's talk about some of the technology gaps and some of the anti-pattern that I see around the technology here. Um, the one of the, you know, category of vendors kind of that we're very well positioned to kind of say, okay, we have we have we have data mesh or, or respond. I guess position to respond quickly. We're kind of cl cloud providers and big big kind of platform providers. And what they offer is, as long as you your data is on my cloud, I can give you some sort of a single pane of view of where this data is, and I can submit add metadata so that you can associate the data to a domain or an owner or a team to kind of give you a mesh feeling uh, an illusion of mesh without really changing anybody's behavior so um and, and and that's only possible if you are in on my platform on my turf right cross platform cross cross team cross account uh, cross trust that is still really really hard to do um the other anti pattern is that you you just keep doing whatever you're doing do your pipelining you know, just labyrinth of pipelines all over the place, get the data out of these silos of databases. And after you landed in on the platform, warehouse, lake, wherever it is, then downstream, we start productizing, I suppose, this data again, with adding some metadata and enriching them so and, and turning them somehow into products onto marketplace. None of these models are, even though that maybe there are incremental improvements for sure, they're not solving the root cause. Changing behavior of data developers right at the point of origin. And that's to create this peer-to-peer -peer, um, scale-out model of um, analytics and ML. So uh, what are the missing building blocks? Um, the missing building blocks in my mind, and that's where kind of personally my energy is going into, is that we need to have a new set of technologies focused on the developer experience that treat data products as a first class concern. Um, the same way that, you know, when we went to microservices, at first <clears throat> we had service-oriented architecture sitting on top of, you know, big application server and then slowly the technology and experience move towards this really autonomous encapsulation of kind of capabilities and services sitting on containers and containers being managed you know by the public like that whole set of developer experience technologies that have been built need to be built for this concept of the data product um, we need to really evolve the set of standards that we are ima even imagining today for this analytics ML based first data sharing. And that 
means going beyond thinking about how my table or file formats are open to thinking about how can I push computation closer to data? How can I articulate computation that needs to happen in a decentralized way to run on the data? So we have a lot to do there. I think we need to think about uh, new ways of integrating technology that wasn't really built for this operating model, was built for that modern data stack, or what we call it right now, at least modern data stack from pipelining storage access to this new topology. And there are some hard limitations that need to be resolved, right? Um, some cloud providers actually have hard limitations on the number of storage accounts you can have, which ultimately limits the number of isolated, you know, um, data products that you can isolate the resources for data products. Um, I guess a, a little bit of a shameless plug as what we're working on at Next Data is to solve some of these. So we looked at kind of from the experience a few years of implementing this, we thought about, okay, what, what lessons can we learn from how we solve these problems in the operational domain over the last two decades? And let's bring those to the world of data. We're working on data product containerization so that it can codify and have an open specification for this concept of a data product. We're hoping to share that um, openly uh, later in the year. We are focusing on this first, I guess, revision of data product APIs and is um, an extensible framework for articulating and in embedding the policy into the data product. So um, if I could wrap this uh, talk with one single message, that would be this, that I think we are, of course I'm biased, um, we are in a very rare moment where there is a really a big vision and clearly a need for it and industry has responded to the, this need and um space for innovation so i welcome you all to be part of part of that innovation moving forward um thank you for listening Sophie, i, guess, I give it back to you i stop sharing for hey, Jean -Marc, thank you so much that was a fantastic talk and so much information in there um, I think you would make everybody in the chat happy if you could put back up that first slide that had the link to the books on, please. There was a lot of interest about that. Sure, um, absolutely. So um, let's get that back up and shared and then we can start some Q&A. Sounds good. Um, I will do that. I actually, as I put it up, I noticed that my link wasn't correct. So let me share that back again with the correct link. Um, um share me again. Here we go. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Okay. Um, and hopefully a kind soul in chat can uh, read those links and share them with everyone else in chat as well. Um, so that people can copy and paste them. Okay, so let's start on these epic questions. We've had some fantastic okay. questions coming in. Um so one of uh, one question and one theme that's come in is that, you know, in, in your book and in your talk, when you talk about data, you're specifically talking about analytics data um, and less so this notion of kind of operational data. Um, is that something that you're able to kind of speak to? And um, do you see this kind of the notion of data mesh be, being extended to cover operational data? Sure. I mean, in my mind, that already exists. We solved that problem. We solved that problem with microservices, with GraphQL APIs, with um, you know REST APIs. Operational data, when we talk about what do we mean by operational data, often I think about operational data that needs to be updated a lot, uh, transactionally updated. There are probably many small, small writes, small reads, um, and rapid change of the data with atomic transactions. Uh, APIs that, again, small reads, they, you read maybe, okay, tell me the customers that bought a certain product yesterday, or show me the details of this particular customer. These are the type of user interfaces or transactions that are meaningful within a business transaction. Analytical data, conversely, is about um, probably not as many small reads, fewer reads, but very, very large reads, right? I need to traverse all the dimensions of customers across time and across geographical locations so that I can process this data, right? So that there's a different access pattern, there's a different read and write pattern. And that's what we haven't solved for. 
And that's why it's an extension. I know people try to convert converge the two into one. In my mind, we have solved that problem. We just need to extend it to analytical data. And I don't want us to get distracted from what the hard problem we have here to solve. If you know, five years down the track, fast forward, there is a technology that somehow manages these two, that's great. But I think when we think about technology, we always have, I always think about the people behind that technology using it day to day. And if you tell me that it's going to be the same person, I probably disagree with you. The same person that wakes up in the morning and thinks about, okay, my user interface, my e-commerce application is not responsive because it's making too many REST calls or, and, or, or you know, the, the APIs are not designed for this transactional relationship that I have with the customer. And they think about the modeling of the database, uh, you know, in a certain way we tell them, no, no, you've got to wake up in the morning. You also need to think about how to design that database so that your analysts and data scientists can do what they need to do. I think that's just too much to ask. You have to have, to have this split brain. So I think even if the technology comes together, I think there's still going to be a separation of concern. But this separation of concern is being implemented as what we call kind of uh, collaborative quantums, as in you have kind of the app developer thinking about the operational data and you have the analytical data product developer thinking about the analytical data and they're working in a very collaborative fashion in the same domain. But I could be completely wrong about this, but I guess that's just how I see the world today. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. And I think I agree with you. Um, so if everyone else disagrees, at least we're on the same page. Um, so some kind of questions around, um, you know, the need for legislation and security, certainly with things in the EU like GDPR and, you know, impacting the ability to, have, uh, well, restricting access to data um, and security. Um, in terms of kind of data ownership and um, kind of determining where to draw the barrier with that kind of data security, do you have any recommendations for how to do that? Yeah, I, I have two thoughts on this. And one is um, we are essentially, we have a physical layer, right? Data mesh does not change the physical layer where you physically store your data, what technology you use or what right geographical location that you use for storing your data. We're creating a logical layer with these data products as essentially logical entities on that to encapsulate, um, encapsulate kind of more of the access control and policies as well as, um, uh, you know, the, the, the control over the change. Like the code that's changing that data is only one code and that's the code of the data product under the control of the data product owner, right? Uh, so uh, with that, then I think people still have a level of, they can make decisions at two level. One is physically how we're going to create the platform that serves these data products so that physically we control where the data lives. So you have a level of control there. And then at the logical layer, the policies that make sense to be implemented at the logical layer, uh, they're, they're actually, I think, uh, more powerful because you can use this boundary of data product even as a way of segregating uh, different classes of data products based on their security concerns. So you might say, in fact, because it's a scale out model, it's not expected from you to have all of your customers in one year data product. You can in, have data product, customers in AU if you're a listed global company, customers in AU, customers in North America, customers. This can be all different data products and you can manage their policies at that level differently based on you know, the regulations and needs. So I think, and, and you can, again, have your cake and eat it too. These data products are linked. They can be linked to each other. They can be aggregated for people that have access to all. So I think in fact, it's boundary of data product is a nice way of um, you know, have a place that at a grand, pretty granular level, you can go as, go as granular as you want within a data product. Um, to to define the boundaries of the different that different policies can be applied, right? And so, who do you see as being responsible for ensuring that those policies are applied at the correct level, and you know, security is managed, and so on? Who who whose job is that? Yeah, I um, preface my answer with uh, with the thought that it's an evolving situation, right? We're still figuring out. People that, that I work with, they they 
come across very, they're honest, very different kind of wider spectrum from still centrally controlled to decentrally domain control. So I think there is a spectrum here. But the, the, the principle and the thinking behind it is that the, the definition of policies, as in how do we articulate quality? What sort of quality standards do we want to adopt? Do we want to adopt W3C quality you know, metrics? Well, how, that's a decision that I think needs to be made globally. And if your organization wants to do that in a federated fashion by inviting domain data product owners, remember that now we have this new role of data product owners because this is a product and this is a long-term ownership, by inviting data product owners into that federated team with subject matter experts that understands quality with, you know, and create this federated governance team to make that decision, that's great. If you want to make that decision top down, you will have a hard time, but that's fine. So at the level of the level that you need a standardization, you want to, of course, elevate those decisions to be applied globally. But then when the question is who is responsible for implementing that so that every data product is exposing these quality metrics, that comes to the domains because they are the ones building the data product. They are the ones that should be responsible and are able to calculating the quality, put it, putting the code that makes sure there are no gaps in the data or the distribution of the data is correct. That's, that's their responsibility. And they get support, of course, from the platform building in the tools that they need so that in a standardized way they can you know, use these libraries or SDKs or whatever technology to expose that. So it's a, um, I, I think that the decisions are made at one level and execution is made as close to the data as possible. Having said that data product design has two ways of um, getting it, again, enforcing the policy happens like actual execution and validation and uh, execution happens at the level of the data product computationally, but how to get the policies to the data product is the idea of the control port where you can kind of globally still author even your policies and get it to the down to the data product, uh, or they can be locally authored by, by the team. And I think that's up to every organization. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we've got a range of questions about kind of um, how can people get started and are there specific examples of data mesh being implemented in specific domains. Um, my suggestion here is to point them to your books. Um, I just want to check whether or not you've got anything to add there. Yes, uh, I think the data mesh, I would say data mesh learning Slack channel that I shared with you and the meetup around it and the podcast around it. Scott Hellman has a data mesh radio podcast that you can hear from uh, everyone that's doing something with data mesh. Um, there are a lot of use ca uh, case studies that shared on the meetup as well. Uh, so connecting with the community will be probably the best source of connecting with your peers who are implementing data mesh globally. Yeah, Scott is fantastic um, to spend time with and listen to in this space, so definitely reach out. Okay, we've got uh, time for one more question, I think, today. So thank you to everybody for the engagement here. Um, Jamak, what do you think about the future of data in the next 10 years? Um, we can, can make go, yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, since, you know, since Moore's law isn't a law anymore, and I know this is a very vague question, but... I'll give you the floor. Yeah, I mean, there's, thank you for that open question. Um, there are many facets to that, right? I've been kind of putting my blinders on and focusing on kind of the social and organizational impact of how we treat data and how we treat data in a way that we get value from it. Um, to me, if I think about as a, at a societal level, we yet, we still depend on collecting a large amount of data before we can get, we can before we can train a machine learning model, before we can have amazing technology and powerful technology like we saw with ChatGPT Chat a few months back, right? So that to me is a can lead to a pretty dire <laughs> situation in future as the people that will have the power to create those competitive solutions are the companies that can sit on the largest pile of data and that's pathologically unfair. So we can either continue that path from the data management perspective or maybe data mesh can be a stepping stone to rethink that and say, just like API economy, 
that really empowered even the small players to come and provide value in the market and have a role by using a APIs as provided by other folks, how can we create that data API economy in a way, it's still in a responsible fashion, keep the ownership and control with the source, but be able to create these fantastic, powerful ML AI centric solutions over decentralized data. So we have two paths to go. I know what my mission is, which path I'm working towards. So I think we get to see what happens, but I hope in 10 years, um, uh, we, we create a more fair and equitable way of getting value um, from data. I would like that very much. Well, I want to thank you so much um, for spending time with us today, Jamak, um, and giving us your, you know, your insights, answering all these questions and telling us everything about Data Mesh. Um, and thank you so much to the fantastic audience we've had today. We've had incredible engagement. Um, we've had over 60 questions come in, um, as well as much action in the chat. So thank you all. Um, this talk was recorded and it will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. And you can find there also some announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities. So be sure to check out learning.acm.org and acm.org. Um, we would be so grateful if you could please fill out our quick survey. Um, this allows you to suggest future topics and speakers. Um, so you should see that on your screen in a moment. So on behalf of the ACM, um, Jamak and myself, uh, thank you for joining us today. And I do hope that you'll join us again in the future. Thanks all. Thank you.